for the welcome you to the Howard Herod Lecture uh, for this academic year. The Herod Lecture was established to honor Howard Herod on the occasion of his retirement uh, because we knew we would miss him. He was a polymath in the areas of ethics, anthropology, the sociology of religion, and given the fact that that's, some of those things aren't what we do on a daily basis, he was a critical contributor for over 30 years to our faculty. It is appropriate then that we have someone who moved outside the area of Bible uh, into the area of sociology to make, to make a major contribution I want to welcome to this uh, podium Professor Doug Knight to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you. Professor Norman Cuphall uh, stands as uh, one of the most innovative and engaged scholars of the Bible during the past 50 years. His published contributions have uh, usually been ahead of his time, uh, and have pulled others of us along with him as they as they come out. Uh, his first volume on the Book of Lamentations appeared at a time when the, there was little attention paid, uh, paid to that book. He produced an introductory textbook on the Hebrew Bible in 1959, titled A Light to the Nation. And its clarity and force helped to educate a whole generation of uh, students to the Bible. His magnum opus was The Tribes of Yahweh, a 900-page tour de force. It was published in 1979. Through this work, he advanced a provocative thesis about the revolutionary and egalitarian Israelites who settled the land and organized an identity ethic in the period before the monarchy. With this book and other works of the type of this time, he and in effect ushered in a new interest in studying the sociology of ancient Israel. His most recent book, uh, The Politics of Ancient Israel, which came out in 2001, still stands alone as the most thorough and creative discussion of this topic. There's another aspect to his career and his life that complements his publications. In the 70s, I once heard a, a friend comment that Norman Gutwald read the prophets and took their ethics into the street. Uh, he told a number of us that uh, he met with him at lunch today how he's always been an activist, starting with uh, in the 1950s uh, in the opposition to nuclear buildup. And then through the civil rights movement and the opposition to the Vietnam War, beginning of the uh, feminist movement in the 1970s, and always on behalf of the third world. Form, he is just now joining with a few others fund, to found the Center and Library for the Bible and Social Justice, uh, which is situated in Stony Point, New York. <laughs> Professor Gutwald is an ordained minister of the American Baptist Church of the USA and is Professor Emeritus of Biblical Studies at the New York Theological Seminary. He's also taught in the Graduate Theological Union. He's the ideal speaker for the Howard Garrett Lecture Series because his own repertoire matches Professor Herod's interests remarkably well. Ethics, sociology, religion, as well as the state study of Native American uh, tradition, which Professor Gulf has himself also uh, uh, addressed. Of course, the bulk of his work is on uh, ancient Israel and the Hebrew Bible. He will speak to us uh, this evening about the Bible as nurturer of passive and active worldviews, and after his lecture, he's that he's happy to take any questions. 
mention of the uh, Light to the Nations, I was always surprised that uh, a lot of Southern Baptist schools adopted that for a text. I wondered for a while if I had slid back, but then I realized, I realized that the Southern Baptists are no longer what they once were. <laughs> I'm very honored to be able to address you on a topic that fascinates me and that moves on a bit from something that I have talked about a lot on the uses and abuses of the Bible. Uh, first, a personal word. In accepting the invitation, I have been surprised and pleased to find a previously unknown point of connection with Howard Herod. Although we never met, he and I have a lot in common in Northwest Montana. Howard was actively engaged in recording, evaluating, and early on challenging the Christian missions to the Blackfeet Nation, <clears throat> whose uh, reservation is located adjacent to Glacier National Park. For my part, I have a daughter who served for some years as a nurse on the Blackfeet Reservation, and a grandson who has lately been active in protecting the waters of Glacier Park from toxic pollution by a mining residue. And because the mine is located over the border in Canada, it required a memorandum of understanding uh, between Montana and British Columbia, I believe. Uh, and my grandson, Will, tells me that Anna Maria Harrod, whom he knows well, has been an active advocate of the environmental care of that corner of the big sky country. <clears throat> I have focused on the range of scholarly and popular hermeneutics that lead interpreters to diametrically opposed understandings of the same text. From a straight on reading of the Bible, one can find support for active or passive life patterns or stances, take your choice. Uh, among the activists, I'm thinking of various liberal and conservative perspectives. Uh, for instance, uh, on the liberal side, I was interested to see the Bishop of London trying to appeal to the occupiers in front of the St. Paul's Cathedral that, that they clear out and allow the cathedral to do its work. And one of the last things he said was, uh, I know you're thinking about what Jesus would do. That's also a question for me. And then on the conservative side, I imagine some of you saw in the paper recently about this preacher who's all for spanking. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child. And he ends up by saying this, to give up the use of the rod is to give up our views of human nature, God, and eternity. Ooh, that's pretty solemn, isn't it? That's pretty solemn. So, there's a lot of uh, stormy justification and appeal to scripture. And what I want to try to do is some exploration of the analysis of scripture. That is, when we are appealing to the Bible for various ethical stances, uh, how true are we to the basic thrust of the social history of Israel? Are we getting it or are we missing it in very important ways? If we go beneath the textual surface, what sort of active and passive patterns do we encounter among the biblical actors as they are reported in the Bible? So that I will be addressing, at least in large part, the common thought that the Bible has nothing to do with politics. And I want to look at the passive and active perspectives on worldly empowerment in order to challenge and contest popular notions that the Bible is entirely or largely apolitical. I propose to do so by showing how biblical communities were both largely engaged in, but also in many circumstances disengaged from political power. In order to approach this topic, I find it necessary to deal with political economy because I think the way in which power was approached in ancient Israel had a great deal almost entirely to do with how they shape society in material terms what their priority, priorities were in the production and distribution of goods, services, ideas for the public good. In a way, answering the question, who gets what, 
and how do they get it, and why do they get it. It's a complex and richly detailed story, <clears throat> and it can be most fruitfully explored by looking at the successive phases of political economy. This analysis of political economy, I would like to stress, is not ignoring or precluding personal individuality and social novelty, which is sometimes the criticism. It is a model that recognizes individuality and novelty to be shaped and expressed in terms of a specific prevailing human environment that envelops and affects everyone living within it, even when some folks stand out in opposition to what the main currents are in that environment. The two major modes of political economy operative in biblical communities were on the one hand a communitarian political economy and on the other a tributary political economy. It's interesting to see how these two modes of uh, political economy interface one another and intertwine often in extremely interesting ways. So beginning with the communitarian, here we are talking about the tribal period of Israelite history, the tribal communitarian political economy. In the mode of production undergirding the communitarian political economy, the producers enjoy the use of their own products without anyone intervening coercively to take away a share of it in taxes or corvée labor or imposts of one kind or another. This was the political economy of tribal Israel, a free agrarian communitarian society lacking a state structure and without a social class that lived off of the labor of others. In anthropological studies, this kind of society is often called regulated anarchy. Think about that a while, that's a great term, regulated anarchy. Generally, we don't think anarchy could be regulated. That's chiefly because we're thinking about the Bakunin type of anarchists who think that they throw a few bombs and they'll start a revolution. <laughs> it's an entirely different wing of anarchy. The norms of such a decentralized, non-stratified society were in line with the norms of its religion. This can be seen in the early poems and stories of the Bible. The property was held by associations of families with entitlement to livelihood, invested in landed holdings, guaranteed in perpetuity. Commercial transactions in property were forbidden, and no interest was permitted on grants of aid to needy families. And it's interesting how Judaism and Christianity have dealt with that very serious prohibition against loans and how many centuries it prevailed in one form or another until finally capitalism prevailed. Self-rule and self-defense were assigned to various functionaries who served in limited capacities. <clears throat> the priesthood had a circumscribed role and was so distributed throughout the tribes that it could not readily accrue commanding political or economic power. Let us take an example of this political economy in which we can see active and passive ways of responding to a challenge. The Song of Deborah in Judges 5 relates how six tribes responded act actively to a Canaanite threat by joining in battle, whereas four tribes chose to sit out the war presumably because they felt no immediate stake in a battle somewhat distant from their own territories. Then there is the Covenant Code in Exodus 20 to 23, which sets forth laws congruent with an agrarian society, both commanding certain active behaviors and condemning passivity in the face of social abuses. The positive laws stipulating certain altruistic behavior were necessitated by the temptation to indulge in social justice or to stand by passively in the face of injustice. And there are some remarkable provisions in that code, uh, among them the, the statement that if you come upon your enemy and his beast of burden has fallen, you are obligated to help him raise it up. So you may have something against somebody, but if they've got a flat tire in the road, you better stop and help. The grounding reality of this period is that Israelites begin their life in this tangibly socioeconomic matter. And at the same time, 
perceived that what God desired of them was the upbuilding of a community in which people control their own lives in equal regard for one another within a rather severe, severely limited natural and historical environment. It was not the greatest circumstances to try anything, much less regulated anarchy. To be religious, namely to be the people of Yahweh, meant for Israel to be this kind of communitary society rather than the kind of hierarchic society it later became. Theologically, we call this the covenant religion. Now the monarchic tributary political economy, I often ask how did it happen? Uh, there are a lot of angles on this and what I tend to think of is creeping monarchism. Stage by stage from Saul to David to Solomon, more and more power was given to the state and not taken back. This mode of production is characterized by extraction of some part of the surplus labor product of its people to support a prospering ruling class. In the first instance, tribute was taken chiefly in the form of taxes, which supported a state apparatus of relatively affluent retainers. Under these onerous tax burdens, the chronic poverty of most of the workers of the soil led to indebtedness for free farmers, who in default of repayment of loans often lost their land to foreclosure ending up as tenant farmers, sharp sh sharecroppers, or hired laborers. Just the terms, indebtedness, loans, foreclosure, strike a bell in our own society. Normally there was collaboration among these takers of tribute, whether collected in taxes or as interest on loans and forfeiture of land. However, there were tensions among the tribute collectors and at times open conflict over the proper division of the surplus taken from these primary producers. The resulting political turbulence, rebellions, assassinations, coups made for frequent change of regime, re regime change in, in that uh, society. An early crisis in state oppression was reached at the death of Solomon, which split the kingdom into two states and brought, I think, some temporary relief to hard-pressed peasants. Autocratic centralizing regimes under Amri, Ahab, and Jeroboam II in the north, and under Uzziah in the south created suffering in the populace, but also protests and fightbacks from prophets and legal reformers. Rulers vied in giving the appearance of protecting and prospering the people at large, but the heavy burden of taxes and indebtedness rolled on. And as the Israelite kingdoms became increasingly embroiled in wars, and fell under vassalage to Assyria and Neo-Babylonia, heavy tribute was imposed on Israel's rulers, who in turn passed the bill on to their subjects in the form of yet higher taxes. The religious aspect of this shift in political economy was a strenuous effort of the ruling class to preempt the older traditions of covenant equality by affirming a royal theology that celebrated the king as the unique beneficent intermediary between God and people, representing the people to God and God to the people. Yahweh, who had formerly been seen as the enemy of Egyptian and Canaanite kings, now became the champion of Israelite kings, even when their policies and practices were virtually indistinguishable from those of foreign monarchs. Although this highly touted royal pursuit of peace and justice is celebrated at points in the Bible, notably in some of the Psalms, the actual performance of these kings is criticized severely in the Deuteronomistic history, in the prophets, and in large swaths of legal and wisdom traditions. Under these conditions, there emerged in the traditions of Israel a decided ambivalence and irony directed at the tributary institutions of monarchic Israel. An attempt is made, I would say, to put the best possible construction on a fait accompli, but not with very great success. With enthusiasm from some, but also grim reservations and indictments from others. Much as today the trickle-down theory is hard to support for many folks who are waiting for the trickle. The voice of God then is heard in different ways by different parties with the communitarian consensus of early Israel giving way to conflictual ecclesial and theological claims. 
and to repeated political power grabs by contending factions. So what happens when we pose the question about the evidence for active or passive stances among the various sectors and classes of monarchic Israel? Clearly, the overall overwhelming tenor of the biblical accounts is to assert and promote active intervention in the course of public life, whether by royalty or by those forces opposed to royalty, whether affirming and praising the prevailing socioeconomic and political life or criticizing and condemning them, it is evident that actors in biblical societies are seriously engaged in shaping public life. Whether the covenant theology of old Israel or the more recent royal theology is favored, the believers in both were active in promoting their causes and determined to keep or gain control of the levers of so sovereign power within the state. <clears throat> but uh, what about the populace at large? Who are, we, who are we hearing from in the biblical texts? I think it is clear that the biblical actors who display this determinedly active outlook on the possibilities of deploying state power for desired ends were in fact a small part of the total populace of ancient Israel. The leading activists are, after all, kings, officials, prophets, priests, and soldiers, and it's not so clear where the common people are, of which there would be a huge number. Maybe not 99%, but perhaps 90 to 95%. We do not hear much directly about the general populace playing an active role in public life. The vast majority of Israelites were peasants, small merchants or artisans who paid taxes but did not have a voice within the governing structures. These majority Israelites are largely passive in the biblical traditions in the sense that they are not recognized as having political will or aspirations. They appear to accept their powerlessness and do not strive to affect any sort of corporate change. Yet when we reflect on this presumed passivity of the mass of Israelites, we are looking at a representation of their position delivered from the heights of the powerful. In tribal Israel, we witnessed a vigorous activism in developing and defending modes of self-rule, self-defense, self-provisioning. Self there were no class leaders then. The true extent of their historical agency is evident. So we have to ask, what are we to make of the seeming passivity of these same people once they are subjects of state rule? Have they suddenly exchanged their activist energy for passive submission to the state? The answer, I think, is largely no. But it takes a little digging to reach that conclusion. In the first instance, the life of the rural peasantry continued under the monarchy in many ways untouched by the state institutions. Of course, the state took their taxes, the state backed up the, uh, those who extended credit. The state uh, probably uh, was uh, conscripting them for the army at times. The Israelite states, however, did not have the technical or logistical means to impose their will unreservedly upon their subjects. Just think about what technology has done to make autocratic powers uh, more successful than they may have been in the past. While they could enforce taxation, they were not able to rationalize and improve agriculture to any great extent. <clears throat> the economic backbone and upholder of the Israelite ruling class remained the small-scale subsistence farmers. And whatever limited gains were made in farming methods seemed to have been offset by the disruption of subsistence farming by wars and by the development of one-crop export economies favored by the crown and its greedy clients who like to specialize in wine and grains rather than the spread of various uh, kinds of products which the subsistence farmer would need. The result was that although drastically weakened, communitarian life in attenuated form did continue over large parts of rural Israel. We do not hear an activist voice from the Israelite majority for the very good reason that their voice was of no interest to the rulers and they were given no channel to speak, at least no channel directly. The ways in which this silent majority breaks through its imposed passivity 
were indirect and unrecognized as legitimate by the authorities. Given the, given the ruling class's dismissal of the voice of the people, is there anywhere in the biblical text that we spy this activism among the silent majority? Granted that their voices are seldom heard directly amid the social and political disturbances that punctuated the history of monarchic Israel. Nevertheless, we catch glimpses of the activist impulses of the populace, both in how they are alluded to in the narratives and in what the prophets reveal about them. We see them, for instance, active in the rebellious labor battalions drafted by Solomon, but led by Jeroboam I to a breakup of the United Kingdom. We see them now and then in the popular traditions gathered around Elijah and Elisha, and in the bloody revolution led by Jehu. Almost certainly, although they were discounted by rulers, the grievances of segments of the larger populace were at work in the social and political upheavals recounted in Kings. Moreover, it is apparent that several of the prophets are advocates for the common people suffering from the blows of accumulated injustice. If they couldn't speak for themselves, the prophets would speak for them. In fact, the prophets are best understood as socially grounded spokesmen for the little people who have been trampled on by abusive power. Prophetic activism is best understood as the voice of the people finding the one way in which they can speak aloud, namely through charismatic figures who enjoy a measure of sacred immunity from political punishment. Since there surrounded the prophet a kind of aura of sanctity, and it was a very dangerous thing to take the life of the prophet, even though they were a nagging a social problem to the rulers. So what are we to make of the activism and passivity of the actors in monarchic history? The active self-agency of tribal Israel is clear enough. It became usurped in important ways by centralized institutions, notably the state and the temple, leaving the mass of Israelites shorn of political power and consigned to social and political passivity. The dominant voices of monarchic Israel mute or censor out discontent and dissent in the wider populace, preferring to describe their critics from the underclasses or on behalf of the underclasses as domestic malcontents or foreign sympathizers. Although I once uh, heard a prominent anthropologist say uh, that he found the natives he studied to be quite satisfied with their lot in life. Po poverty wasn't a big problem for them, he said. However, other anthropologists have documented unrest in contemporary peasant populations that give rise to fertile forms of passive resistance, foot dragging, sabotage, pilfering, the weapons of the weak, as James Scott has put it, lending ample opportunity for activism they can practice short of open rebellion. From some source, there is a saying, uh, when the great Lord passes by, the peasant bows ceremoniously and passes gas loudly. In such cases, the so-called passive resistance is hardly passive at all, any more than Gandhi's nonviolence understood as satyagraha, soul force, was passive, not to mention king. Now, the colonial tributary political economy is interesting because, although this is called the exilic period commonly, it's better understood as the beginning of a dispersion of Israelites throughout the ancient Near East, a rebuilding of semi-autonomous internal authority structures in the homeland, dependent on the tolerance of foreign empires, but a scattering of other communities all over the ancient Near East and heavily in Alexandria, Egypt. In this process, local Israelite communities lacking the customary leadership relied on grassroots communitarian strategies, submerged under the monarchy, but now in order to survive and develop identity in small groups of religious practice, these methods were revived and developed with a collection and refinement of traditions. With the restoration of colonized Israel, community in Palestine, tributary political economy returned in an acutely painful double-layered form, which we had seen before. 
The imperial powers, Persia, Hellenistic regimes, and eventually Rome, employed Israelite leaders to keep Palestine in line and to help extract taxes and serve as a buffer zone against Egypt. The elite were thus on a tightrope between their imperial masters and their fellow colonials. It was hard to please both. In these circumstances, religion was invoked as a sanction for keeping law and order. But as power and wealth concentrated in the priestly establishment and the native civil service, resistance arose and periodic reforms were launched to ameliorate the worst conditions. The reform pushed through by Nehemiah as a Persian appointee was the work of a leader who astutely realized that the province of Judah might lose Persian backing altogether if its leaders were too greedy or abuses of the larger populace and, and there was a popular uprising that shook the province. The later Maccabean and Hasmonean wars had quite as much to do with class antagonisms as with cultural and religious issues, as continued to be the case with the unrest in first century Roman Palestine. Now amid the harshness of foreign domination and widening abuses of wealth and power, many Jews relinquished hope for a just order under the prevailing circumstances and turned to a form of passivity expressed in apocalyptic modes of thought as were developed very well by Dale Martin in his presentation earlier today. Apocalyptic modes of thought that restricted relevant activism to standing firm while awaiting the inbreaking of the kingdom of God or in a kind of flip turned over into an act of rebellion. The, the apocalyptic thing is passivity or activity. It, it can swing either way and it remains a question who wrote the book of Daniel. And I'm inclined to think it was among those who were actively engaged uh, in the rebellion. In contrast to the enforced passivity of the silent majority under the monarchy, apocalyptic passiv passivity was more a matter of free choice, in a sense free choice, though they would not have felt free in making the direful conclusions, a free choice for coping with world weariness and failed hopes. As for the political economic stance of Jesus, only someone habituated to spiritualizing Jesus can fail to see how he confronts imperial, colonial, and tributary mentalities with a radically communitarian ethos of religious and ethical obligation. In his overt teaching on wealth and power, in his persistent association with people from marginal class strata, in his forthright attack on the temple economy, Jesus showed a consistent preference for communitarian forms of political economy over tributary forms. Do not do as the Gentiles do, who lord it over one another. Sums it up very well. <clears throat> although he appears not to have taken up arms, uh, although uh, Dale uh, introduced a very interesting suggestion that uh, his followers were armed, would like to pursue that. Uh, and he seems not to have been affiliated with any ex existing political group as far as we can determine. Jesus' own circle, circle of followers formed a communitarian grouping with definite political bias that stood objectively in opposition to tributary hierarchical values and practices. The nonviolence so often attributed to Jesus uh, in, in, in a kind of uh, apologetic gesture, often in an effort to negate the worldly force of his teaching, was anything but passive, earning him the enmity of Jewish and Roman authorities who correctly perceived his threat to the established order. And I think probably the Gospel of John has the best summation of that when it speaks about the Jewish leaders collaborating in order that one man should die for the sake of the nation. Now, what does this uh, inquiry ask of us in, if this is at all correct, uh, what, what does it suggest to us? Well, it suggests that a lot of our conclusions about activism or passivism are drawn on very slim, superficial grounds. 
But first and foremost, we can lay to rest the ghost of biblical disinterest in the mundane world of politics. They had political views. They were politically involved more often than not whenever they were able to do so. In actuality, the peasant majority that constituted tribal Israel was highly activist. But when overtaken by the monarchy, the avenues for peasant activism were sharply curtailed. There were also decided limits on activism in colonial Israel, since Jews were beholden to their imperial overlords for permission to order their community life one way or another. Because of the inability of biblical actors to do much politically in certain situations, oppressive situations, <coughs> this has often <coughs> been mistaken for obliviousness to secular affairs due to their supposed preoccupation with spiritual matters. And this is a great mistake in biblical interpretation. Secondly, the political views and actions of Israelites were intertwined with their religious views and practices. Those benefiting from state power viewed God as accessible, primarily, if not exclusively, through political and religious leaders. While those adhering to equality or near equality before God, authorized by covenantal theology, champion decentralized forms of self-rule. Those resorting to apocalyptic passivity viewed God as powerful but distant and inscrutable and withdrew from political action, and yet this very passivity might suddenly produce an outburst of violence in an attempt to bring the rule of God here and now. The great variety of ethical and political stances delineated in the Bible renders all efforts to prescribe ethical and political stances today based on any particular template or text or set of texts or group of rules makes it all problematic and even dangerous. The many-sidedness of the Bible in ethical and political matters points us toward the many-sidedness of the array of ethical and political stances in our own world. This means that we must think for ourselves, both individually and especially in community, to find the proper mix of activity and inactivity to further the ethical and political goals we share with others. In this sense, the Occupy Wall Street movement in its various forms uh, is engaged in that process of bringing individual conscience and reflection into communal discussion. A recent book following up on a popular book from the end of the 19th century, What Would Jesus Do?, uh, has the title, What Would Jesus Really Do?, and really is capitalized. And it's a wonderful piece of reflection in which the author is able to approximate on some topics where he thinks Jesus might have fallen, and on others to say, I don't really know, I can't really say, and we shouldn't be too dogmatic about these matters. With respect to the appropriate mixture of acting and not acting, we need to distinguish between passivity that is forced upon us and pa pa passivity that we choose as an attitude or style of life or tactic, as we also need to constantly reassess the options for activity. In order to distinguish those actions that are actually likely to further our goals and those that are only spinning wheels or worse yet, may undercut the laudable goals that we have in mind. And this is why the anarchist uh, fringe movements in the Occupy Wall Street are, are, are a very sad development uh, because they draw attention away to what needs to be done. And they are spinning wheels. They are carrying out frustrations. Uh, and uh, I don't know of any case where Bakunin has turned right, has been correct, that a few assassinations and coups can uh, start a major social revolution. It appears then that this reflection on the ever-shifting mixture of activity and passivity in the biblical traditions points us sharply to the need for us to treat the Bible as one, but only one valuable resource, among others, for finding our own ethical and political niche. Normally, I think we start out with some kind of ethical conviction or ethical hunch or inclination, and then we come to the Bible. We have to 
acknowledge that hunch or inclination or conviction as the primary start, uh, starting point and then enter into conversation with the Bible on those terms. This uh, reliance on the biblical text as one and only one of the sources of ethical and political activity or inactivity has the effect of not only in its overtly expressed values, but also in the way biblical scholars actually behaved, biblical actors actually behaved. The importance at this point of connecting the narrative, the story that is told about these actors with the teaching and the laws. There's a wonderful uh, selection of genres which can play one against another to help us see uh, that they were in a situation very much like us, playing a lot by ear in spite of uh, having some very strong traditions to call upon. So the, con the, con the conclusions that we draw, I think, must be uh, heartening, but also sobering. And I would say in some cases, it's probably better to forget about the Bible and just get on with business and when we do attend to it, have a little sharper eyes for what we are seeing there or not seeing there. I thank you. Well, I need, oh, he'll need that. I, no. Mine will still work? You're still hot. I'm still hot, okay. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay, you're gonna field the questions, okay. Well, it certainly falls under that category of mixtures of activity and passivity that I suggested are very clear in apocalypticism. And what the little work I've done, Koheleth, leads me to believe that these, uh, the voices here are the voices of what we might call middle class. These, I think, are the uh, retainers and bureaucrats working under the king, and they have been kicked around a whole lot. So. Everything said about the kings is negative except for the I speaking at the beginning. Solomon has somehow been idolized. But he's, he, he, he's egocentric. He's not concerned with the rule at all. When the book then turns to how kings actually rule, it's a horrible story. So there's a mixture there that I haven't quite figured out how to resolve. Why would they hold Solomon up to such virtue and then everything else they say about kings, negative? Or are there different voices here? Thank you. Excuse me? Uh, yes, though I think it has occurred elsewhere. Well, it certainly occurred in Rome. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. Some of, some of the anarchists are principled anarchists. They actually believe that these actions can bring about the revolution. Others, I think, join in because they are impulsive and lose control. 
uh, and it's hard to say what all, what kind of mixture we have there, except that if they would only hold a mirror up to themselves, it, it would help a whole lot. Uh, and I think right now, especially in Oakland, a lot of effort is going into trying to isolate uh, that fringe group. Uh, among other things, some of the uh, occupiers joined the city workers and the small business people in cleaning up the graffiti, sort of, you know, and damage, actually doing something to indicate to the community that that, that destructive activity was not what they were about. But I think it has been a problem maybe in some other cities. Denver, it's now how many places? Over 100, I think. Uh, Missoula, Montana has one, and Kalispell did at one point at least. Over uh, worldwide, 950 worldwide. Yeah, tr truly astonishing. Yeah. In a way, you could say it all started, of course, it's not a straight line, but in terms of the sequence of events, it all started, it started with some fruit peddler who committed suicide in Tunisia, I believe. And then it blew, and then Egypt blew, and now Libya and Syria and Yemen are just hanging on. And Bahrain is suffering the worst as Saudi Arabia crushes it while we keep our fifth fleet there and more or less remain silent with what's happening. Yeah. Uh, should go if you're going to uh, take the Bible seriously at all for mm -hmm. uh, politics. Yeah, yeah and, and in a situation where the church is certainly not in the commanding position, then a lot of the functions that we have within that are, are in between, mm -hmm. in between the common people, so to say, those untrained in some of the things we're trained in, and those with the power. Uh, I'm always very hesitant to try to estimate the motives. I, 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 I kind of like to think that Nehemiah had some caring for the people. He certainly speaks with vehemence, uh, but I think he also was a, was a reforming pragmatist. He saw where this would be going if there was an open revolt. And I think he also, he involves himself, he includes himself in the reform since he has had slaves that he's releasing. And I think there's pretty good evidence that he has uh, some means, that he has prospered in exile and has brought that. And he doesn't, he says, I, don't, I didn't even use the food allowance that I could have used because I, I can fund myself. And I even fed people at my table. You know, it's a little bragging here. But uh, I think it does indicate that he has some room to maneuver. Uh, and I'm sure the Persians would be grateful for anything that kept the lid on. And I, I don't know what to say today. It would have been, certainly the mayor of Oakland is no example of this because she switches around very, uh, very capriciously. But I think a certain Nehemiah-like kind of character might have produced very different results in Oakland. I don't know that we would have had that police attack which set off the chain of unfortunate events since. I'm, I'm going to have to come closer. The word controlled anarchy or organized anarchy? Reg regulated anarchy. Regulated. Yeah. How would you describe that? How would that 
were, were, were you referencing that conceptually? Huh? Yeah. Well, for the immediate picture, I think the occupation movement is an example of regulated anarchy. They have general assembly and they decide things by a majority vote, and they even have the people's microphone where, where the speaker says a short phrase and then the nearest group of people sit, repeat it and it's repeated and it finally gets to the outer circle. The way it, way it worked in that society and in many societies like it, and that's you know, where I've studied uh, Iroqu the Iroquois and Iceland and many others, is that uh, the, the major needs are met in a way that satisfies, that tries to satisfy the basic needs of all the people who do the producing and who do the deciding. Uh, so you have judges uh, who will deliberate over cases of abuse in the community. As the occupation has had some abuses, they're now having to deal with some crime. And, then, and, and they've got some big tough guys like bouncers uh, <laughs> on Wall Street <laughs> who take care of some of these people who are you know, creating problems. Uh, and leadership is uh, for a stated period of time and with limited powers. And the positions are rotated a good deal. Uh, and it has a lot of virtues except that it's very vulnerable to being crushed by centralized power. And that's, that's the problem, you know, the Paris Commune in 1870, uh, where the people took over Paris after a disastrous war in which Germany won. They only kept it for three or four months because when the French army finally gathered together, they crushed the, the commune. And in the commune, there was basically that you could recall, you could recall positions from office and and so forth. So regulated anarchy imposes a tremendous responsibility. And I think a lot of the things that we try to do in churches probably are some form of, some form of that. Because we're not, I know some pastors are giving top-down rulings, but in many churches, there really is an effort to get everybody in the act. Thank you very does much. that help? It does, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Well, personally, I think so. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, what's the question? Whether my, whether my analysis has any bearing on the present situation in Israel and Palestine. And I think the place where I would begin is to look at the uh, economy of the West Bank. That's where ancient Israel began in the West Bank. And those Palestinians who pursue agricultural activities are reflective of what the first Israelites were doing. So that already raises a suspicion of hermeneutics. And uh, then another step, for me at least, is that no religious claims can be set forth politically in an apodictic fashion, that they're absolute. Because you're going to get two that conflict an absolute Israeli claim, an absolute Arab or Muslim claim. And how's that going to be resolved? Only by force. And that runs against, I think, a strong current in the Bible that is, that is trying to find a way to bring, to bring peace among people. So I think there is a, a relevance, uh, which means then that I'm not giving the voice of Zionism a strong militaristic cast. which some do. In fact, uh, Dale dealt with that today, didn't he? Sort of American forms of Zionism, manifest destiny and exceptionalism. Uh, we can do things that other nations can't. Did you have a, other ideas on that? No, I was curious about the name. Um, yeah. I don't have any idea, but it seems to me the fundamental thinking, thing is, however it occurs, Israel has to recognize that it is an occupation of the West Bank. 
how that's resolved, whether they do some trading. One thought was, you know, in return for the settlements remaining, certain amounts of Israeli territory would be given to the other. There, there are a lot of ways in which it could occur. But Israel has to accept what that, what that UN resolution set forth. Not just because it's a resolution, because it makes sense. You know, somebody occupies my house, my community. They got to get out of there before, before we can have a real conversation. But that's the problem. The getting out looks like it has to be a part of a larger settlement, which is hard to reach when you don't have good feelings on both sides. But th that seems to me to be the precondition. And of course, uh, the Palestinians would, would have to accept the existence of the state of Israel. I mean, I think that's clear. We're long past the point where we can wipe out Israel, as we are long past the point where we can forget about the Palestinians. <clears throat> um, my question is about some of the most successful social justice movements over time were they born in what came out of inspiration and desperation? Who? Yeah. Um, for example, how that might transform you, and spoken a lot about how traditions block each other. Oh, how? Yeah. Well, of course, all, all, all the parties have reference to their religious traditions understood in various ways. And some of it's uh, inspiration, and some of it is desperation. And uh, what, what you have in the Bible, I think, is, is, is ultimately a hope, which is not facile at all, but uh, the hope based on the belief that there is a better way for people to live and that, and that that is possible, although it's going to take, take great effort to, to reach that. Did, did you have something more particular or specific in mind? How are we going to get there? How are we going to get there? And of course, some people taking the passive route say, it's too big for me. I can't do it. Well, of course I can't do it. But it won't happen without a lot of I's and U's being a part of whatever it is. So I say work at it in any way you can and are, and are, and are able to work. And I have respect for uh, all those who have an, underta an undertaking and uh, some sympathy for those who get violent, but it's not gonna work that way. I don't think it's gonna work that way. So, thank you for your courtesy and listening to me. <laughs>